um, that has recently undergone um, several environmental disasters, um, which have been exacerbated by um, imperialist plunder of natural resources and displacement of uh, indigenous groups, uh, and connect that with um, work that RSCC has been doing around uh, research in the Bronx and um, uh, environmental issues there. So um, I'll just start it off with kind of just a, a basic um, framework for us to work from and some guiding questions as we go along uh, with the other panelists that we have today. So on the basic, imperialism and the environment, the, the relationship that imperialism has on the environment very broadly is one of depletion and also of dumping. Um, so depletion meaning uh, stealing natural resources at a large scale um, and creating marginalized oppressed classes by uh, unequally redistributing um, resources, which then upsets indigenous, local, and traditional economies. And in the meantime, while resources are getting taken out, um, surplus products, uh, other things are being dumped, including pollution um, and uh, uh, militarization. Um, and also really important uh, in this issue is that destruction of the environment also opens up opportunities for um, imperialist agendas to come in as an entry point to create new markets and to build, um, build itself. Uh, in prepping for this, I was reading this book that um, Leila let me borrow, um, and this quote really stood out to me. Colonial expansion uncannily syncopated the rhythms of natural disaster and epidemic disease. Each global drought was the green light for an imperialist land rush. So um, in, in imperialist environmental plunder, there's, there's kind of a deliberate way to, uh, to create um, conditions in order to um, continue that type of uh, uh, agenda. And um, a section in this book that really stood out to me um, that might provide a framework for us today is um, three points uh, that the author, Mike Davis, um, pointed out um, in, for the creation of the origins of the third world. One is the small production. Small production in poorer countries was forcibly incorporated into commodity and financial circuits and controlled from overseas, which then undermined traditional food security. And, um, in other words, particularly looking at the Philippines that has an import-dependent and export-oriented economy, um, that the economy there was then um, the economy there was then instead of being used formally for local subsistence, was then attached to um, a, a global economy and global needs. Um, there was an integration of millions of tropical cultivators into the world market which also was coupled with dramatic deterioration in trade terms. So uh, these countries were no longer um, making, uh, they were no longer able to um, practice their own sovereignty, uh, their own self-determination. Um, their production was no longer tied to just sustenance, but to a larger scale. So three guiding questions that I think can um, can help us moving forward in this panel is one, from the third world perspective, particularly in the Philippines, which Gary will um, discuss in just a little bit, what can be offered to the global environmental movement um, by mass movements organizing against imperialist environmental plunder? And then later from Khalil's presentation on the Bronx, in a first world context where we can find internal snapshots of the third world, like the Bronx, how can the environmental movement be interpreted as a struggle for democratic usage of land? And lastly, for Fernanda's section, using Hurricane Sandy as a local case study, how can we apply lessons from Mindanao and the Bronx to prepare ourselves for future disasters as well as agitate, organize, and mobilize the people towards a socialist future for our environment? So just keep those questions in mind um, as we go along. We'll have three panelists speak and then a nice chunk of time for question and 